I'm John Duvall. Welcome to the Scriptural Way Bible Study. The Scriptural Way Bible Study is brought to you by the Seminole Point Church of Christ, located at 16300 North May Avenue, Oklahoma City. On behalf of the elders and members of the Seminole Point Church of Christ, I would like to thank you for your interest in spiritual matters. Now, let's take our Bibles and seek the scriptural way. A study through 1st John. Good evening. I'm John Duvall. I'm Dale Decker. And I'm Luke Haley. This is a Scriptural Way broadcast. Luke, welcome to the study tonight. It's good to be back. It's been a while. Yeah, it has. John, John has taken the night off and we brought Luke in. Luke was actually with us when we first started the first, our study of 1st John. And I think you were with us for about two different sessions with that. Yeah, it got us through, uh, we went through chapter one and now I'm back here at the end of chapter two. That's right, that's right. Dale, how's your day going? My day is going very well, thank you. Wonderful. How about your day? It's gone busy, but well. Well, <laughs> I don't think I've ever known Dale to have a bad day. I never have a bad day, no, because day, every day is what you make of it. Absolutely. Each morning I wake up, I say this is gonna be a good day. That's right. Next week for our motivational talk, we will cover this. <laughs> <laughs> and how's Travis and Jimmy over there? <laughs> We're going to put them on camera one day. We should. We've got a camera in position to, we to we, put them up there. We probably need to dress them up a little bit, though. Now, they're the technical tech guys. So. Yeah, the tech guys don't have to dress up. The Motley Crew. Well, I hope that you are doing well, and I hope that your week has gone very well for you so far. And I want to thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us for this study. It is always, as you know, our intention to seek the scriptural way in all things, to actively pursue what the Bible has to say and here at the Seminole Point Church of Christ that is fundamentally our goal to do things in Bible ways to teach only what the Bible teaches. I want to, to remind everybody that coming up shortly September the 29th we will have our three-day fall gospel meeting with Matt King. It'll be in Friday night September the 29th at 7 o'clock for a 30-minute period of song service and then worship at 730 and we'll meet that Friday, Saturday and Sunday Sunday mornings will be our regular time, and Sunday night we'll meet at 7 um, and 7.30. So mark your calendars for that. If you live in the Oklahoma City area, we'd love for you to come and be our guest. If you don't live in our area, then we will be broadcasting it live, as always, so that you can hopefully benefit from the lessons, just as we will benefit as well. So we're all looking forward to that. Matt King uh, was here for a training program. We've talked about him before, and it's good to have him come back. It's not the first time he's been back to the area. He held a meeting um, in El Reno. He did. And um, so we brought him back, and so we and are we looking have, forward to that. We do have the topics on the website, too, do we not? We do. We do. Fantastic. If you'll, if you'll go to, um, after the study, if you'll go to SeminolePoint.org, there should be a link at the top of your viewing page right now. But if you'll go visit that, you'll see a little ad about the meeting, and you click on it, and it'll give you the list of subjects that he's going to be talking about covering. So, very much so looking forward to that gospel meeting. We, uh, lo, lo, I want to, um, if I can talk right tonight, thank you for being with us in the chat room. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, we solicit your comments and your questions. Uh, you can sign in with the, uh, with the, the chat roll uh, sign-in method if you have that. You're supposed to be able to sign in with Facebook if you'd like to do that, or just sign in as a guest. If you'd like to comment and give us your questions, we'd love to hear from you. And let us know where you are. If you're a first-time viewer and participant in the study, we'd love to know where you are um, tuning in from. So let's start with 1 John chapter 2, verse 27. We left off last week. Uh, having concluded up to verse 26. There are two more, three more verses actually in this chapter that we need to look at. And gentlemen, when we look at the last three verses, what we see here, I believe, is a direct admonition of the people, of John to the people, to continue to abide in the Lord. Now when we look at verse 27, we find there that John is reminding the brethren that the anointing has prepared them for their stance against false teachers, and the stance was crucial to them abiding within the Lord. Let's, let's read that verse, Dale, if you would. Yeah, verse 27 says, But the anointing which you have received from him abides in you, and you do not need that anyone teach you, 
but as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things, and is true, and is not a lie, and just as it has taught you, you will abide in Him. All right, we talked some last week about the anointing, and I'm sure there are a lot of different views of it in the denominational world, or even in the religious world, period. And when we, when one of the things we pointed out is if you kind of compare this to the Old Testament, when the high priests were anointed for a task, basically they were chosen. They were chosen and prepared for a given task. And I think the way John is using this terminology, that would be a good way of describing it. You know, the anointing that they had received, um, though it was the word that God had given to them, that the Holy Spirit and the word that he had given to them. Lou, any thoughts? Uh, I, I think that's a great definition. The word I like to use is ordination. You're ordained to do something. You're appointed for some sort of divine service. And you find that attached to not only the priests of the Old Testament, but also prophets and kings, that That's God right. had appointed them for some sort of divine service um, in his physical kingdom, and the same applies today in his spiritual kingdom. That's right. And uh, I thought of one point also that um, when you're talking about the idea of, of knowing that we abide in him, not only is he talking about or giving assurances or encouraging us to abide in God, but he's giving us confidence to know that we are with God. Right. That's a, I think that's a very valid point to make with that. It's, it's our confidence in his assurance mm -hmm. that we are with him and he's with us. That's a good point. Dale? Well, and that's the whole point. I mean, it, you go all the way back to verse 24 and it says, let truth, I mean, the idea is that let truth abide in you. And now he's admonishing them to, uh, to, that they have a responsibility to continue in the truth and to teach the truth. That's right. Now, one thing he says here when we looked at the verse, he says to them, and you do not need that anyone teach you. Now, he was not saying that the saints did not need teaching, but that they more, that they did not lack the knowledge. Um, you know, as, as, as preachers and as teachers, oftentimes we will teach repetitively on the same subject. You know, think about the number of sermons that you've listened to, and you could probably pick one subject and say that you've probably heard it a hundred times within your life, and probably by the same preacher, <laughs> you know. And it's not because that, that you lack the knowledge. You do, you do have the knowledge there, but we always have to be reminded of it. You know, so John says, but as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things, it's a continuation of the teaching process. They had the word, they'd received the anointing, but they needed to continue to be reminded of these things. Yeah. Luke, let's look at Second uh, Peter chapter 1, verses uh, 3 and 2 for a moment. Okay. I'm sorry, Second Peter 1, verse 3. Okay. That's what, that's what I thought you meant. <laughs> As his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and God, godliness, through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue. Okay. The anointing or the preparation, the word, continued to teach the brethren all things. And the Lord had given to them all things that pertained to life, that pertained to godliness. And of course, within this context, would prepare them to stand against those who would attempt to deceive them with false teaching. In uh, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, along the same lines there, Paul says to Timothy, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction and in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Everything. All scripture has been breathed by God for our singular benefit and use. Any thoughts? Um, one thing came to mind, especially with that, that last verse talking about being equipped for every good work. Um, there's something that it also plays a part in this idea of being anointed. When, mm -hmm. you can, when you consider Christ being the Christ, meaning the anointed one, literally is what that means, with that anointing, Christ was ordained or appointed to a divine purpose, that he right. was appointed by God to be our sacrifice. He was appointed by God to be our high priest, to be his prophet, and to be ultimately the king. That was his divine purpose. We share in, in that anointing that God has anointed us with the Holy Spirit and that we also have a divine purpose. And that divine That's purpose right. is that in that kingdom, under Christ's reign, we serve as priests. We serve as his servants um, in his church and throughout this life, and that we have to, and part of that in this idea of, of uh, being equipped for every good work is that we have works of righteousness that we have been assigned to us to perform. That's right, that's right. What do you think about what Peter says, that, that we are his, his holy nation, mm -hmm. his royal priesthood, 
And to that end, you think about what Romans 12, 1 tells us, that we are to present ourselves as living sacrifices exactly. unto God. Yes. You know, so we are priests, and therefore we are, uh, we are to offer these sacrifices. And it's what you're talking about. We are, when you think about Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10 says, we are created for good works, yes. you know, for the righteous obedience unto God. Dale, any thoughts? Well, I think we have to keep in mind one thing, or a couple of things here too. Is, is if we go all the way back to Acts, the eighth chapter, remember when Philip went down to the Samaritans and began to preach and teach, and there were many baptized at that time. Then the apostles came down and laid hands upon them that they might receive the power of the miraculous to be able to perform miraculous uh, deeds. And this was primarily because they did not have the written word. This helped right. them be equipped for every good work. Today we have the written word, so we are equipped with every good work as well. A lot of people look at Acts 2.38 and we, and we talk about the gift of the Holy Spirit. All Christians receive that gift because it is salvation. That's and, true. And we need to keep that in mind. These individuals, uh, John is reminding them that, look, you have the ability, you have everything you need to teach the gospel, stand fast for the word, and be true. That's right. Avoid yeah. these false teachers that are coming in and trying to teach other things. And you know, it's very likely that some of these false teachers were accusing the apostles themselves of teaching lies, mm -hmm. of trying to deceive the people. Um, in verse tw uh, 27 that we read just a moment ago, he goes on to say, but as the same anointing te teaches you concerning all things and is true and is not a lie. It's very possible that he was referencing the charges made by the false teachers that the apostles were teaching error, that the apostles were, li were lying. And the truth is, as long as the word, as long as the anointing abided within the saints, the saints, they would be able to walk in the light, they would be able to faithfully follow the Lord, and they would abide in Him and remain within His fellowship. And that's the point of the last part of the verse there, you will abide in Him. Yeah. Well, now, any, any thoughts before we go on to verse 28? All right, if you're in the chat room, feel free to speak up. If you have any comments, we'd love to hear from you. As we've said before, oftentimes, we enjoy the study process, and it, it helps us out. But the study is, is made that much better when you participate, and you let us know what your thoughts and your comments are. Before we go on to verse 28, though, we will go ahead and... Uh, we're going to take our verse break. We started a few minutes late due to a, a glitch on my part. <laughs> and so instead of trying to correct it too much, we began just a few minutes late. But we're going to go ahead and stay the time and take our first break. On the other side of the break, we're going to look at verse 28 and show how that as long as a Christian abides within him, that is, abide within Christ, that they'll have no reason to be ashamed. They will have no reason to be ashamed whatsoever. Stay tuned. We will be right back. Hello, I'm Ron Witt, one of the elders of the Seminole Point Church of Christ. On behalf of the elders and members of the Seminole Point Church of Christ, I would like to invite you to be our guest at any of our worship services and Bible classes. The meeting place of the Seminole Point Church of Christ is located at 16300 North May Avenue, Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, zip code 73. 013. The Seminole Point Church of Christ meets Sunday mornings at 9.30 for Bible classes, 10.30 for worship service, and 5 p.m. for our afternoon worship service. We also have Bible classes on Wednesdays at 7 p.m. Whether you live in Oklahoma City area or you are traveling through Oklahoma City, we would love to have you come and be our guest. We have Bible classes for all ages. At the Seminole Point Church of Christ, our focus is to teach only the Word of God. Rest assured that when you visit with us, you will find that we will appeal only to God's precious Word. Now, let us return to our study. Let's start with verse 28. And Dale, if you would, read, read that for us, please. And now, little children, abide in him, that when he appears, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. When faithful Christians stand before the Lord, they should be, actually I should say leading up to that point, living a life of faithfulness, they should be able to stand before the Lord being confident 
not within their own lives, but within the promises of the Lord and the things that He has already said. And we kind of talked about this before about the promises and the assurances that we have, and we put our confidence not within our own selves, but within the Lord Himself. As a matter of fact, let's think about what 1 John 4, 17 says about this, this uh, confidence in the Lord. Luke? It says, Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as He is, so are we in this world. Now, this boldness in the day of judgment is, is not talking about a pharisaical, um, self-righteous, self-confident boldness, but it's fundamentally our faith in Him. One meaning, there, there are four different Greek words, actually five, but four fundamental Greek words that are translated faith or a variation of faith. And um, within those words, one of those words is a, um, it talks, it talks more about our trusting in Him. You know, one deals more with the being convicted and persuaded by the, the truth, by the evidence. But an, another one has to do with the idea of my trust in Him. And this is what he's talking about there, is our trust, our faith within our Heavenly Father to, to take care of us. You know, it's that boldness, I believe, here that he is talking about. So I think it's also the same boldness that the Apostle Paul had when he said, I've kept up the faith, I've fought a good fight. That's right. And now there awaits for me a crown, a crown of righteousness. And the idea is that even today, uh, you hear people when they're asked, uh, will you be going to heaven? And the comment is always, well, I hope I will, or I think I will. Right. No, what John's saying here and what Paul said is you need to have the confidence and know for sure that you're going to heaven. You should be able to say, I have fought a good fight. I've kept up the faith. And if you can't do that, then there's some changes that need to be made in your life. That's a very good point. That's a very good point. I think also what John is doing here for us is he's further developing this idea of what, what this anointing does for us. He introduced it, introduced it first up in verse 20, but now he's getting more deeply into this topic. And he's talking about how this anointing, that the, the Holy Spirit, as it works through the Word of God, that is where the knowledge of God, the true knowledge of God comes from, is yeah. through the Holy Spirit, the work through the apostles, which we have in Scripture. And now what he's telling us is now with this knowledge of God that you abide in Him, is that you now have confidence that when, when Christ comes again, when judgment comes, you know that you know God. And not only that, God will know you. That's right. And there's no shame. I, I kind of compared it back to the Garden of Eden when after Adam and Eve sinned and God God came looking for them that they had to hide themselves. There was shame for what, what they had done. We have no shame when we come before God. There is no shame because we know that through Christ and His sacrifice that we have been sanctified, that we have been justified, and that we have been striving to live our lives righteously. And it's almost parallel to what he's written over in the beginning of chapter 2 when he says, um, by this we know we have come to know Him if we keep His commandments. Right. Chapter 2, verse 3. That's right. Well, you're talking about not being ashamed. I'm reminded of what Paul wrote in Romans chapter 9, verse 33, where um, he says, As it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and rock of offense, and whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. We will have no reason to be ashamed. That's exactly right. Any thoughts, gentlemen? Dale? Yeah? No. <laughs> well, let's go ahead and step on in verse 29 now. Verse 29. And what we find when we look at here, 1 John 2, verse 29, that since the Lord is righteous, it is possible to truly tell who is born of Him and who is not born of Him. And in actuality, this lays kind of a fundamental, um, or is more of an introduction to some of the discussion we'll see in chapter 3. But let's read that, 1 John chapter 2, verse 29. Dale? If you know that He is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of Him. Okay, this is a very, very solid thought here. That if we know that the Lord Himself, that He is righteous, then we should know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of Him. Now this is flying against the teaching of the Gnostics of the day. You know, they were claiming that they had some sort of uh, ethereal knowledge or understanding and their following God didn't demand a physical righteousness on their part. Right. And John says that's not true whatsoever. Any, anyone can claim to be of God. Anyone can just spout those words off. It's almost as if John has twisted the argument around and saying the evidence of your conversion is not in your claim to be converted, but the evidence of your conversion is in your acts of righteousness. 
That's it. And he's, and he's almost, he, it's the conclusion of the argument, again, that he's brought up at the beginning of chapter 2, where he says, you know that you've come to know him if you keep his commandments. He says in verse 6, the one who says he abides in him ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. The That's evidence right. of your conversion is not in your claim of conversion, it's in your actions. That's right. Well, this, the same thing works with love. You know, we, we bring it down to a, a modern day illustration there. I could, you know, a, a boy could tell a girl that he loves her all day long, mm -hmm. but unless he is showing it within his actions, she has no reason to believe it. Right. And so a claiming to be in fellowship with God, but without the true actions of fellowship becomes a lie. Well, and, and that's very true. And, and along with what both of you say, uh, you know, people should be able to see Christ in us through our words and actions. And oftentimes the only Bible they read is the Bible they see. And uh, it is said, uh, I've not seen the tombstone myself, but in New York City there's a, tomb, a, a grave of a 12-year-old girl. Mm -hmm. And the epitaph on that gravestone reads, uh, she made it easy for us to be good in her presence. Uh, another good example of that is uh, a Christian was asked one time, if you could have one wish, what would that wish be? And he said, you know, I'd like to have the ability that wherever I walked and my shadow was cast, that good would be done without me knowing about it. Mm -hmm. and that should be the attitude of the Christian. We should automatically be doing good, not having to consciously think about, well, should I do good or am I doing good? It should be an automatic thing. That's if we right. truly are uh, practicing righteousness, mm -hmm. it would be automatic. Yeah. That's right. That reminds me of verse Dale's Colossians 3, verse 3. says, For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ. Our life is hidden within Christ. And when people see us, they don't see us, but they see Christ working through us. That's right. Mm -hmm. It is, you know, those of us who are claiming to be born of Him, we are doing what you're talking about. We are following His examples of righteousness. And therefore, we are living righteously. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's exactly right. Matter of fact, let's compare this to 1 John chapter 3, verses 7 through 10. We'll get into this passage later uh, in next week's study, more than likely. But I want to go ahead and introduce 1 John 3, 7 through 10, and, and notice the comparison here with what he just said in verse 29. And Luke, if you would read that. Sure. He says, Little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. He who has sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whoever has been born of God does not sin, for his seed remains in him, and he cannot sin, because he has been born of God. In this the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is he who, works, nor is he who does not love his brother. We'll elaborate more on this as we get to that point in our study, but we see the contrast. You know, it's easy to tell the difference between one who's a follower of God and one who is a follower of the devil. And here's the thing, you don't have to actively be running around saying, hey, I'm following the devil in order to be truly following the devil. You know, fundamentally, if you don't follow God, there's only one other path and that's the one you've chosen. There's one other connection here, mm -hmm. too. When, when he talks about, we read over in, in verse 9 of the passage we just read, talking about the, seeding, the seed remaining in him. That seed is a parallel to that of um, the Word of God. We read yes. in James chapter 1 that we are born of that seed, and also in 1 Peter. And this, this also plays in this idea of being anointed, the Holy Spirit working through the gospel, guiding our lives, is that idea of being anointed. That's that, of, of that true knowledge of God, knowing that we abide in him and he abides in us. Absolutely, absolutely. And we'll have a few things to stay on that when we get there mm -hmm. because it's, that's a very good point. And uh, I had forgotten about the passage in James when putting the lesson together. We've got the First Peter verse in there, First, uh, first Peter 1 towards the latter part, but that's a good about James. Um, and it's, it's something that we have to keep in mind because the Gnostics of the day was teaching something contrary. Mm -hmm. And he's basically telling the brethren, if the word's in you, you're not going to live ungodly. Right. If the word is in you, you're going to live righteously. You will practice righteousness, effectively, is what he's saying there. Um, now, when we talk about practice righteousness, one thing we must know, it is possible for an individual to outwardly do the right things when inwardly they're not following God. And we must make certain that our, our servitude to God comes or begins first within the heart. In Romans 6, verse 17, the Apostle Paul wrote to the brethren in Rome, But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. And he's commending them because they had obeyed from the heart 
that form of doctrine. Right. Yeah. Any thoughts? No. I think Romans 6.17 is a very good verse to uh, finish chapter 2 on because of the fact that that key phrase there, you obeyed from the heart. That's right. Uh, it, it eliminates the outward appearance. And uh, it goes back to what I said earlier. Uh, people should be able to see Christ in us not only through our words but also through our actions. That's right. That's exactly right. Luke, any more thoughts on chapter 2? No. Nope. That's you right. Got it. Okay. Well, let's do it. I want to do just kind of a brief recap. When we were looking at chapter 2 before we take our break, just remember that some of the things that he's pointed out here is that we are to be doing our very best to walk as children of God to always make certain that our spiritual state is right before God, that we are abiding in His Word, and that we're not following the ways of the world. And that when, there, when we encounter people who are teaching error, we don't listen to the erroneous teachings, but we allow the truth to abide within us, living as His children. Very, very fundamental and important point to remember. Well, we're going to go ahead and take our next break, and on the other side of the break, we'll go ahead and step into chapter 3. If you haven't done so already, uh, download a copy, a PDF copy of uh, John chapter 3. If you're looking at the box beneath the video window and you say, I don't see it down there, you need to refresh the page. You may have been viewing, um, you may have started viewing before I actually got that updated. So anyway, you can go ahead and download that if you'd like, and we'll be stepping into 1 John 3 on the other side of the break. Thank you very much. We'll be back in just a moment. Hi, I'm Rhonda. I'm a member of the Seminole Point Church of Christ in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. The Seminole Point Church of Christ has outstanding Bible classes for all ages. We have teachers who are dedicated to teaching God's Word in insightful and energetic ways. Please come visit us and bring your children. They will love our Bible classes and you will be benefited. Hello, my name is Dale Decker. I am one of four elders here at Seminole Point Church of Christ. We are very fortunate to have a Bible-loving group of Christians here at Seminole. Our Bible class teachers are second to none. We have Bible classes for all age groups. Our goal is heaven, and we make every effort to ensure that the Word of God is taught at every age group. We hope that you will come and check us out. You will find that we are a very friendly and loving congregation. We are located at 16,300 May Avenue in Oklahoma City. And now back to our study. Now let's go ahead and step into chapter 3. We've, we've, we've um, been looking clearly at chapters 1 and 2. And by the way, I just observed the introduction. I need to rewrite the introduction for chapter 3. That's the same one for chapter 2. <laughs> so, um, and you'll also note that I have out beside the, uh, the link that it is an incomplete study. It only takes us down to about verse 10. And hopefully by next Tuesday, I'll have the rest of the chapter worked up. And you'll have that all there for you. But let's start in chapter 3, because 1 John chapter 3 really develops, on, develops upon the idea of us being children of God and exactly what it means to be children of God. And then he brings it into the, the discussion of how our being children of God should affect our love for one another. And what we're looking at here is a very, is a very important point that I think may indicate that the brethren during that day were having to deal with the temptation of uh, not loving one another. If, if the Gnosticism was creating a division within the church, as some scholars speculate, then you may literally have had brethren turning against brethren. It's one thing to be, to be divided from a brother because he's chosen to walk in doctrine. But I, I walk in false doctrine, that is. But I've seen instances throughout my life where brethren who are standing for the right they almost act as if they have no love for the brother that, is, that has embraced error. And that cannot be allowed. You know, we, we, cannot to, we cannot allow that within our lives. Um, one thing I needed to point out from the chat room, Rosalito made a point just prior to the break, and this goes along with the end of chapter 2, that wherefore by their fruits ye shall know them. And in the context there of Matthew 7.20, that is of course talking about identifying false teachers, but that talks, but that applies to ourself as well. Yes. People will identify us by our fruits. And David makes a point that it's hard to improve on perfection, John. <laughs> Thank you, David. <laughs> See, John Hall does a real good job of reading ahead before he reads out loud. <laughs> 
Um, but you're right, the Word of God is perfect, and we can't prove it. We cannot improve upon that. <laughs> How's that? Well, let's, let's go ahead and start reading 1 John chapter 3. And what I like to do is we're going to take this one verse at a time because um, if we, we, we could try to read all ten verses of it, but I'm afraid we'd kind of lose as we go along you know, where we're trying to be. So we'll just take it one verse at a time with this. So, Dell, if you would, let's read 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called children of God. Therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know Him. When we look at our lives, we find that we are God's children. Christians are God's children. But the reason why we are His children is because of His love for us. Now, what is interesting, and this is what you just read, that because we are God's children, the world is not going to look at us and readily recognize us for who we are. So let's kind of build upon this a little bit. Luke, Paul, in Romans chapter 8, verses 14 through 17, talks more about how we are made the children of God. He, he says, For as many are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, as a Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And of children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with them, that we may also be glorified together. Now, on one hand, I recognize that by creation, all mankind are the children of God by creation. However, when it comes to the discussion of the church, we truly are the children of God by the spirit of adoption. We have submitted our lives unto Him, and therefore, he, did, you know, as, you know, he begat Christ through the miraculous birth. And so in a literal sense, Jesus was born into this world, literally. And, um, and so in that sense, he is the Son of God. And I think that's an interesting point. I don't want to deviate too much. But I've often found it interesting that when you study about Jesus Christ, that at least in my studies, it's not until after he comes to this earth that you see, his ref see it being referring to him as the Son of God. And he is the Son of God, not because some point way in the distant past, God gave spiritual birth to Jesus, like Jehovah's Witnesses teach, that God created Jesus. He became the Son of God when he was born of a woman, you know, took upon that role, born in the flesh. Well, we cannot be, we are not born into this world in the same manner of which Christ was born into this world. Neither were, neither were our spirits pre-existent and deity as his was, of course. So therefore, the only way that we can become the children of God is when he adopts us. And that's what Paul talks about there. I, I, see, I see two different things being pointed out in, in verse 1 of chapter 3. One is this idea of, of, of beholding or, or, or understanding the awesomeness that is God's love, considering that he made us his children. And that's that's a very weighty statement because sometimes we don't we call ourselves children of God but we don't understand exactly what that means mm -hmm. and Paul brings that out in that first read Romans chapter 8 if you are children of God number one God has loved you so much that he provided a way that he would call you family right. that he would call you his children and that we could approach with confidence and call him our father but moreover as children we have all the benefits that come with that children father relationship That's just right. like I am a physical heir of my father's asset someday we are heirs fellow heirs with Christ uh, as children of God That's we right. share we have a part in that heavenly kingdom you know if, if you would Paul in a sense puts us on a equal level with Christ only in that we are children as he is the son of God and therefore joint heirs with Christ right and I think it's good well, thought there Revelation chapter 1 talks about how we actually have a place on that throne. We are royalty in terms of in, in right. God's eyes as part of that royal family. Peter calls us a, a, a royal priesthood. Right. We have a part in that kingdom as heirs. And that's part of the rich spiritual blessings that only take part inside Christ. That's right. That's a very good point. A couple of things from the chat room. David, uh, or Daniel, I'm sorry, he makes the point, and I, I think it's a very good comparison here. He says, I love the opening, very similar to John 3, 16, for this is the way God loved the world. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think that's a very good point. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. John is, is and, and it's interesting, John recorded that conversation that Jesus had, and now John again refers back to mm -hmm. the love, the same love of God. 
<coughs> the, the second part also that popped out here was this idea of the world not understanding us or right. knowing us. And you, you go back to 1 Corinthians where Paul talks about those who are not spiritually appraised cannot understand spiritual things. As children of God, being of the Spirit, being led by the Spirit, we are born of the Spirit. Right. Um, the world, when we, is, if they see us, our actions being guided by the gospel, by the Holy Spirit, they're not going to understand us. They're not going to understand who we are or what we stand for. That's something that's not going to agree with them. That's right. Well, let's connect this with Romans 12, right. what God expects of us. Mm -hmm. um, as a matter of fact, let's read that uh, Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. The Apostle Paul writes, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service, service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. The world does not recognize us because we present ourselves as living sacrifices unto God. The world does not recognize us because we are no longer conformed to the image of the world, but instead we are transformed by the renewing of our mind. Uh, a quick parallel verse yeah. in uh, the Gospel of John, John chapter 15, uh, verse 18 says, If the world hates you, you know that it has hated me before it hated you. If yeah. you are of the world, the world would love its own, but you, because you're not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Exactly. And that's the being called out of the world, being called out of the world, and we are enter into Christ, into that kingdom, into his church. We are not of the world anymore, and because of that, the world will hate us. That's right. That's exactly right. There's a passage over, I'm not, I won't be able to quote it, I think it's 2 Timothy chapter 3 where Paul talks about those who desire to live godly will be persecuted. Yes. It okay. is a qualifier. We will stand out from the world and the world will hate you because of, our, of the righteousness. That's right. Yeah. Well, in fact, Jesus told his disciples that very thing mm -hmm. in the, the uh, accounts of the gospel. And we see that indeed that came true mm -hmm. uh, as he said it would in the book of Acts. When That's the apostles went out, they began to teach and everything, and even Saul, who later became Paul, uh, persecuted the church. He himself admitted, I stood there and I approved of the death of Stephen. That's right. That's exactly right. Well, let's think about what Paul, instruct, what Paul instructed the brethren Ephesus to do that would directly lead to this particular situation. He told the brethren in Ephesus, and this, this is Ephesians chapter 4, 20 through 24, and I'll have Dale to read that. But he told the brethren in Ephesus that you are to put off that by which the world would identify you and effectively put on the new garb of Christ. So let's look at that, Dale. Uh, Paul said to the church at Ephesus, he said, But you have not so learned Christ. If indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning your former conduct, the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put off on the new or put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Exactly. This isn't some obscure concept that we agree with in thought, but is impossible to obtain in action. This is something that God expects of all Christians, to literally put off the ungodly behavior of the world, the ungodly pursuits, the ungodly desires, and put on the godly things. You know, as he says in Colossians 3, seek those things that are above, not the things that are below. And of course Christ said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. And if we do these things, the world will not know us because we will no longer look like the world or act like the world. We will be, follow, we will be looking and acting like our Father, right. like God. Any other thoughts or comments? Uh, let me look over for just a moment. David makes a good point. Or he, he brings into the discussion 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. And in 1 Peter chapter 4, note with me here that... Um, yeah, that's a very good point, David. He says, therefore, 1 Peter 4, verse 1, therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same mind. For he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. And in verse 2, he talks about that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh for the lust of men, but for the will of God. And he goes on in verse 3, gives some examples of things that we have left behind. And people who look at us in verse 4 think it's strange that we no longer run to the same excess of rioting that they run to. But he reminds us that they will have to give an account to God, as, as so will we. 
That's a very good point. A matter of fact, that actually discusses the very, <laughs> it really elaborates very well upon the idea the world will look at you and they won't know you. Mm -hmm. It's a very good point. Any thoughts? Well, the question we have to ask ourselves, are we going to be like Peter before the day of Pentecost who denied Christ? Or are we going to be like Peter after the day of Pentecost and stand up for Christ and make sure that the people know that I am a child of God? Therein lies the question. Mm -hmm. yeah. Have you ever seen a child who is clearly ashamed of their parents? <laughs> I, I, I know that I, I saw this um, happen many, many years ago, many, many years ago, where um, this, this kid threw a rock in the, in the parking lot of the church building and hit one of the teenage girls. And the mother found out about it. And when, when she was driving, she, she, you know, they, they whipped the car around and she was yelling at the kid out the window. And the girl just held her head down. She was ashamed of how her mother was acting like that. And, um, you know, we do that sometimes. We're out in public, maybe we don't think, maybe something gets us enraged or we get upset. And we're going to respond right, right away and our kids later tell us, Mom, I was ashamed of you. When, when Hannah was real little and when she was in kindergarten, first, second, third, fourth, fifth grade until she got too fast to run, um, or she began to run, I would always sing to her as she walked up to her door, the little did, ditty that I made up. And it was, it was cute when she was in kindergarten. She tolerated it in the first grade. She started rejecting it in the second grade, and her teachers was asking about her weird dead in the third grade. You know, and um, so I think there were moments where she was probably ashamed of me, but hey, I was just <laughs> expressing my love for her. Um, but my, po my point is, is that when we seek to live the godly life, that our Heavenly Father is not one that we should be ashamed of. We should pronounce gladly to the world our faith in Him and our following Him. Nor will He be ashamed of us. Well, that's right. That's, you know, that's kind of the point. Jesus told His disciples in Matthew chapter 10, verses 32 and 33, that if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father which is in heaven, and then vice versa. And I think another way of referring, of saying that effectively is if you are ashamed of Christ, He'll be ashamed of you. And if you're not ashamed of Him, then He will not be ashamed of you. Um, any thoughts or comments? All right, before we step into verse 2 of 1 John chapter 3, we'll go ahead and take our last break for this evening. And um, be looking ahead as we talk about that. We're going to, we're going to look a little more closely at this idea of, of us being children of God. And, and an interesting fact, we don't know what we will be like when the end of time comes, but we have the confidence that we will know that we will be like Him. We'll kind of talk about that. Stay tuned. We will be right back. Hello there, I am John Duval. I am a member of and the preacher for the Seminole Point Church of Christ. Please allow me a few minutes of your time to share with you some information about the Seminole Point Church of Christ. The Seminole Point Church of Christ is under the oversight of five elders who guide the congregation in their service to God. These elders lead a very faithful group of people who love God and follow His Word. The Seminole Point Church of Christ has Bible classes for all ages, which meet every Sunday morning at 9.30 and every Wednesday evening at 7 o'clock. Our Bible class teachers are dedicated to helping educate our children in the Word of the Lord and in the work of His church. On behalf of the members of the Seminole Point Church of Christ, I can tell you that our goal is heaven and that we make every effort to ensure the Word of God is taught to every age group. It is our hope and prayer that you will take the opportunity to come be our guest and to learn more about us. You will find that we are a friendly and a loving congregation. Our place of worship is located at 16300 North May Avenue, Edmond, Oklahoma. Now, let us return to our study of the scriptural way. Before we step into verse 2, we had a couple of comments that came up in the chat room that I think are very relevant to what we were just discussing. David made the point um, of Matthew chapter 10, verses 37 and 38, where he says, He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me, and he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. And then Daniel, he brings to our, our mind Matthew chapter 8, verse 38, 
where we see the word ashamed. For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of him, the Son of Man also will be ashamed when he comes in his glory. So the very thing we were pointing out that Matthew 10, 32 uh, and 33 could be read as, this is exactly the way Jesus worded it here. So I appreciate that, David and Daniel, for bringing those to our attention. Very, very good points, though. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, let's go ahead and look at verse 2, Dale, of 1 John chapter 3, if you would. Yeah, John says, Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Okay, John clearly states in this verse right here that it is it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. And and even to this day, you know, when, when the final pages of Revelation was written, the Bible still does not reveal to us in detail what our eternal spiritual existence will be. I mean, you, you can't point to something and say, oh, you know, that's what we will look like. You know, many times people picture themselves in heaven, two arms, nose, and a mouth, and, and so forth. Jehovah's Witnesses believe that if God chooses to remember you, then you'll be restored to your physical form and live forever on a physical earth unless you're part of the 144,000. The fact of the matter is, is that we will be all spiritual and we have no clue mm -hmm. as to what the spiritual form of our beings look like. And the point is, it really doesn't matter. That's God right. is a spirit and we were created in His image. We were created in Christ's image. We were created in the image of the Holy Spirit. That's exactly right. By the way, Daniel made both those points I mentioned earlier. I forgot. I, I read that wrong. Yeah. Go ahead, Luke. Um, I just I think the point maybe he's trying to make with bringing verse two out is that in, in, in verse one he's talking about how the world will not understand us. They they will not be able to see us. They won't understand who we are. But I think also it's hard for us as we're in this physical body we don't really understand what it means, what we look like spiritually. I mean, the, the gospel, I thought the entire gospel, it describes us what Christians are. It says we are, we are of the light, we are of God, um, we are holy, that we are saints, that we are priests, but it's hard for us to, in this physical, that's not tangible. Right. But what John is, is, is ultimately saying is, is, just know this, in the end, when God, when, when, when God comes back, when Jesus returns, we will be like him. And that's something for us to look forward to. Under, maybe it's something, something we can grasp a little bit more. That's right. Yeah. We know that there is a better state right. that awaits us. Paul even talks about this uh, in 1 John chapter 15, verses 47 through 53. It's kind of, uh, or 1 Corinthians 15. Um, it's kind of a lengthy reading there, but I want to look at it because he discusses this transition. He doesn't give us much more information about it, <laughs> but he discusses in general this wonderful transition. And uh, Luke, if you would, let's, let's read that. Yeah. Paul writes, The first man was of the earth, made of dust. The second man is, is the Lord from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are made of dust. And as the, as the heavenly man, so also are those who are heavenly. And if we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep but we shall all be changed in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. There's so much truth there, but fundamentally it all boils down to a change. You know, we won't be in heaven like we are today. We will be in heaven eternally like our spirit is. And we, as we already said well ago, the Bible doesn't reveal that to us, right. you know. Corporal versus incorporeal corporeal beings. We have no idea. Hollywood makes an attempt to show maybe what it, an, an, incorpor, an, an incorporeal, I'm not sure if that's the right word, being looks like. I'm not going to try it that one. But, <laughs> <laughs> but they don't know. You know. And the good thing is that we have his assurance that we will be changed and we will be with him eternally. Dale made a good point um, that I'll, I'd like to reiterate here. Yes. Um, there's, there's a fundamental truth about the gospel that I believe is that this spiritual change that it talks about begins here on this earth. We talk about we are transformed at baptism. We are transformed by the word. Uh, James writes about how through the trials and tribulations of this life and as we endure we become perfected, that God is perfecting mm -hmm. us. And uh, Peter writes in Second Peter chapter 1 that 
he writes these scenes to them, it become partakers of the divine nature. And as Adele just said, it, it is God's mission, God's purpose, that in this life, he's, he's begun to work in us that he would make us like him right. in his image spiritually. And what Paul and John are writing about really is, is, the, is the conclusion of the spiritual change that's already begun here. He's going to perfect it in the end where he, we become like him, that we put on immortality, that we become incorruptible, and we ascend to heaven with Christ to live forever. Well, you know, this goes right along with what Paul wrote in Ephesians chapter 5. Although he's talking about the husband-wife relationship, he uses the church as an example. And he says that he might sanctify, verse 26, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, mm -hmm. not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy without blemish. That's the very thing that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. You know, we make up the body of Christ, and it is his goal to prepare us for the presentation um, unto God. Yeah. A passage read earlier already, Ephesians chapter 4, uh, verse 22, where it talks about putting off the old self, putting mm -hmm. on the new self, says, the new self which is made in the likeness of God. That's right. That's exactly right. David says Paul makes a similar point in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, but says the bottom line is we will be with Christ. That's what matters. Yeah. Dell, any thoughts? No, I agree with what you're saying here. Well, then why don't you read for us verse 3? Well, if you insist <laughs> that I should, I guess I will. John says, and everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. All right, this hope of being like the Father should cause all Christians to purify themselves or to be purified by the blood of Christ, by that word of God. Um, 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1 talks about a, a striving to cleanse ourselves from all filthiness. Luke? It says, therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Okay, now notice that. He says, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit. The, the thing is, here's what he's talking about. I recognize that without the blood of Christ, we can never be made clean. And it is by our repentance and the blood of Christ that our sins are washed away by the blood of the Lamb, that we are made pure, that we're sanctified before the Lord. The thing is that we have to continue to cleanse ourselves. It, it's kind of like you, you tell your child, go wash your hands before dinner. So he goes, washes his hands. And then he goes outside and he plays into the dirt, in the dirt for five minutes. And he comes back in, he has filthy hands. You say, I told you to go wash your hands. I did. Yeah. We have to keep ourselves clean. We have to keep ourselves pure before the Lord there. Mm -hmm. Be holy as he is holy. Exactly. That's exactly right. An ongoing work within our lives. And that's this idea of, of, of us being changed through, through the Holy Spirit by the gospel into God's image, that we should be holy, that we should be pure, just as He is holy. And coincidentally, you know, the, the Scriptures call us saints. Saints literally means holy ones, or those who've been sanctified. That's right. And sanctified is the idea of being set apart mm -hmm. for a particular work, mm -hmm. anointed. Yes. And we, yeah, we've been ordained or appointed to a, a, a divine service That's right. in, in God's kingdom. You know, many people go through their lives wondering, well, what, what is God's will for me? And I've known people like that. Well, I just don't know what God's will is for me. And th they'll wonder, what is God's will? The fact of the matter is His will is for you to be holy, for you to follow Him, and to seek first His kingdom. I, I thought that very same thing when I was reading this passage. We, we question, what's the purpose of life? Why am I here? Right. It, it, John is spelling it out for you. His purpose is for Him to transform us spiritually, for us to escape the corruption of this flesh, the corruption mm -hmm. of sin, and, and, be, and be with Him, be like Him. Exactly. Following His example. Dale, what about uh, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 14, and what Peter here talks about the, the, the diligence that we are to put forth? Well, Peter says, Therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things, be diligent to be found in Him in peace without spot and blameless. Uh, Paul also said in, uh, to the letter to the church at Ephesus in Ephesians the fourth chapter verses one and two, he said, I, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love. The King James Version uses the word vocation mm -hmm. instead of the word calling. And you think about that a little bit because we go to work every day and we call that our vocation. Our hobbies, our hobbies are our avocation. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes Christians make going to worship service and serving God an avocation rather than a vocation. 
And what Paul is saying here to the church at Ephesus is, uh, I beseech you to walk worthy of the vocation with which you were called. We weren't called to do this secular job here mm -hmm. on earth. We weren't called to go to uh, 12 or 16 or even 20 years of, of uh, college or high school, college, and so on to learn to do this secular job. We were called to make our uh, journey, uh, our walk, worthy of mm -hmm. the Lord. And that's what Peter is saying here too. Therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things, be diligent, diligent, in other words, with all the mustard, uh, the gusto that you can put forth. Put forth 100% right. effort. It's, it's either do or don't do. There's that's no right. try. You either become a Christian, you either become that saint, uh, that royal priesthood, or you don't become it. That's right. And that's what Peter and Paul is saying and John as well. That's right. To be found by him in peace without spot and blameless. James writes in James chapter 1, verse 21, that we should put aside all filthiness, remains of weakness, receive the word. And he says in verse 22, and prove yourselves doers of the word. That's right. That's right. Daniel makes a good point in the chat room in reference to 1 Timothy 4.12 that we are to set, that Paul told Timothy to set an example in purity. You know, in the, the living that pure, that sanctified, that set apart life. And then Rosalito made the point, said we will, uh, we will be like him, or we, I'm sorry, I can't read right, will be like him is need to follow his example. John chapter 13, verse 15, for I've given you an example that ye should do as I have done. So we follow his example. We follow his righteousness. Good point. Yeah. Any other thoughts on that? Well, I think what let's do, because of our time, and since we start a little bit late, we'll end a little bit early tonight and give you a few extra uh, minutes in this uh, busy week I'm sure that you were involved in, um, as we all are. Let's plan next Tuesday to start with verse 4 of 1 John chapter 3, verse 4 of 1 John chapter 3. And what we will show in this particular section is that if we are living as children of God, then we will not continue sinning. And um, the, the English Standard Version, I think, renders this section very well in regards to the idea of what he means by, if you know, my word abides in you, you will not sin. Mm -hmm. And we'll talk about that next week in the course of this study. Um, as Christians, we should all be striving our best to faithfully follow God, to live as He would have us to live. That involves both the, the commands to say no to temptation and the commands to do, to do the things that He has told us to do. Uh, David says in the chat room, I've been preaching a series of sermons on Ephesians. It's interesting to see how many times Paul uses the expression walk, meaning a lifestyle. That's exactly right. It's a very good point. It is our lifestyle to live as children of God. Dale, any further thoughts? No, I just want to thank our chat room for, <clears throat> at first I thought maybe we were doing such a good job that you had no comments, but I appreciate the comments because they do help us and, and they certainly bring to light a little bit more about what we're talking about here. Uh, so it makes the study a lot better, and I'm delighted that we have as many people as we have participating. Absolutely, absolutely. Lou? I just want to thank you for having me here again. I appreciate I appreciate you being able to take the time to, to fill to fill in a spot, and um, it's it's really good to have you as filler. Yeah, Luke. Anytime <laughs> you want to come on board, just let us know. Oh, you absolutely. Know, one yeah. of us will stay home. <laughs> John can't stay home because he has to run the chat room. Yes. Well, I'm sure somebody will take a break that night for you as well. And I want to thank you for being here with us tonight for this study. If you're watching this at some later point and you've heard something about which you have a question, feel free to write to us. You can send your questions to questions at scripturalway.org. If you live in the Edmond, Oklahoma City area, we'd love for you to come out and be our guest. More information about that can be found at www.seminolepoint.org. Until next week. I don't know why I say that at the end of every program because I don't know where I'm going with that. We will see you next week. And we may look you, forward to seeing you next week. That's right. We look forward to seeing you next week. And in all things, remember to seek the scriptural way.